I've never seen an API that has stayed completely static for its lifetime. There's always changes and sometimes changes get missed. So we need to both strive for that ideal of perfection, which is great, and also prepare for what happens when something goes wrong. Having all of those expectations laid out explicitly in the beginning gets you a long way down that track to getting all the people to work together because you know that not everybody is gonna work for your company for their entire life. Being able to understand that the technology is not always gonna work exactly the way you expect is critically important. Welcome to the API The Docs podcast. My name is Laura Wasch and I'm going to be your host today. And I welcome my guest, Dan Grabsky. Uh, thank you for joining and hi. Hey there, yeah, thanks for having me on, Laura. Dan is by profession software engineer and technical writer. He's uh, calling with me from Portland, uh, Oregon. And the reason why uh, I knew to invite Dan is because um, he gave a presentation at Write the Docs last year uh, about Zen and the art of automanually creating API documentation, which is already a riveting title, but the presentation itself was, um, I normally don't call favorites, but it was one of my favorite presentations. I loved the form and I loved uh, the message that you were giving and it was a, uh, Thank you for doing it. Yeah, thank you. No, it's great to hear those one of your, one of your favorites out there. It's uh, funnily enough that was actually the first time I've given a presentation at a conference. So <laughs> there was there were a lot of firsts involved in that, but at least it went seemed to go pretty smoothly. It didn't sound like this was your first presentation, like at all. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we will talk about the docs processes and people causing all kinds of trouble there, uh, but the book that you uh, started referencing first. Um, why this book? Yeah, the the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Persig. It's the book is almost a bit anachronistic now, just because of when it was written. But the the basic idea of the book is it follows a man and his son on a motorcycle journey across the country, and their trials and tribulations with their motorcycle. They travel with some friends who are on a different motorcycle that breaks down and. Um, Robert Percy goes through some deep philosophical discussions with himself during this during this journey. And the main theme that he brings up is uh, a concept called quality. And he sees that as a sort of balance between understanding the technical side of your machine and your own intuition and trying to find that balance between the two. And it's I definitely don't advocate as to reading the entire book and taking it all verbatim and using that as your philosophy. But there's a lot of bits and pieces in that that I think are really applicable to any of us working in technology. There's, you know, just like a really fancy BMW touring motorcycle, there's tons of technology that we can't necessarily understand everything about how it works. But at least knowing a little bit about what's going on ends up being invaluable for when something goes wrong. While I fully agree, I have a suspicion that this is so close to your heart because you've been on the top notch edge of running machines and understanding what's going on because you were involved in car racing, right? Yeah, I was an uh, engineer in both Champ Car and Indy Car Racing for about 10 years before I moved out to Portland in 2009. Um, I was an engineer at Andretti Green Racing, now Andretti Autosport, for a bunch of years. Um, did race strategy for Danica Patrick, still only professional racing win in Indy Car. Um, I've got an Indy 500 ring here somewhere. Uh, traveled a lot all, all over the place and uh, made made race cars go faster, <laughs> for sure. This is also why you were talking so much about know your machine, but there's your intuition. So at that speed, intuition matters a lot. Exactly. Yeah. It's, you know, the one philosophy that another engineer taught me back when I worked in racing was you can, <clears throat> you can look at the data coming off the car and like, they can tell you kind of whatever you want, but you need to listen to what the driver is telling you and then use the data to back that up. You can't just blindly look at data and say, oh, okay, this car is doing this through the corner, so we have to make this change while the driver is screaming that they need something completely different. And again, it's a real balance because sometimes the driver feels a thing and it's not actually what's going on. So you absolutely can't take one just, on, just at face value without considering the other. 
I felt this concept in two ways. One was dipping my tiny toes into martial arts training and realizing that all of my mental blockers are totally true in a physical world too, and vice versa. And the other is when I read the book, I think The Inner Game of Tennis, and the tennis coach is talking about this a lot, that you can understand everything about the trajectory and whatnot, but there is a fundamental interplay that you feel. And if you can focus on that feeling, sometimes you can be a better player. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I used to play tennis not very well, but I, I totally understand where they're coming from because there's absolutely certain techniques and skills that you just have to understand physically. You need to be able to hit a forehand and a backhand shot and all of this. And then once you get those fundamentals down, there's so much more to add on to that. And you get to the point where hitting a forehand shot, like Rafael Nadal, I'm sure, doesn't think about the specifics of where he's positioning his hand for a forehand shot. But he can do that instinctively and put his mind on the more high-level things like you're talking about. So that's on the edges of performance. But what you are saying is that actually on any level of performance, it matters that you understand both the mechanics, the ingredients, and how they work, and people who are not as simple to explain. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the big things that I try to get across in the talk is that, you know, we can talk about understanding this balance balance is important, but why is it really important? The biggest part, at least in my experience, is when something goes wrong and being able to recover from that. Because there's a big difference between, you know, for an example, let's say you've got a customer who's using your API and there's one field at one endpoint that isn't documented correctly because the backend performance has changed for some reason. And there's a big difference between the customer trying to use that, it failing, and then them being completely lost. And that failing. And then all of a sudden the customer is like, oh, I understand from the documentation that this is going on. So now I can kind of recover from it. There's a very big gap between those two ends of the spectrum that we can start working our way towards making these processes more resilient, helping customers be able to solve problems without even having to think about it. Because invariably something goes wrong. I've never seen an API that has stayed completely static for its lifetime. There's always changes and sometimes changes get missed. So we need to both both strive for that ideal of perfection, which is great, and also prepare for what happens when something goes wrong. While I was listening to you now also and your presentation also, I was fascinated that not once did you use the words practice or socio-technical, which to me was a bit telling that you're not coming to these truths from an academical research point of view, but from very real experience and you were able to to bring these through without making it overly complicated that thank you for that and you got me at the word of resilience which is a big thing now yeah yeah and and that's absolutely true a lot of this i've kind of figured out on my own it's it's funny i actually volunteer out of burning man every year doing peer support crisis support helping people in conflict And it's hilarious the amount of people in our group of volunteers who have absolutely no experience with psychology. None of us are, you know, very few of us are therapists. A lot of us work in tech. I've actually got a a couple of friends who are tech executives who volunteer out here. And, you know, they go into a situation where two people are angry at each other. One of them stole the other's food. The other hasn't slept. Yet we've all learned through practice, like you're talking about, how to get into that and help people figure out the solutions to their problems. So I absolutely firmly believe that this is something that people can learn. You don't have to come from that academic background to be able to pick up these skills. And it absolutely does take practice. (laughs) But if you can go into it, at least with the mindset of okay, there is this interaction between technology and interpersonal relationships. Even if you make little small improvements, that's that's still worthwhile. Incremental improvements was one of the things that you were guiding us towards. Um, and what did you say? Do not make great to be the enemy of good. Um, very good advice. How did you say this play out in API documentation teams? 
Yeah, so I, I really like using the one example that I, uh, I forget if I bring it, brought up in the presentation, but I worked with an API recently for from another company where every single endpoint was beautifully documented. It, there was thorough documentation for every single field. You knew exactly what each endpoint did. But when it came to putting the whole thing together, you were pretty lost. I It took me about half an hour to figure out how I took the results from one endpoint and used it to call another endpoint to do a different different process. There was a very good focus on each individual endpoint without seeing the context of everything else around it. It's one of those where that's a very good place to start, but then the next step is how do we tie this all together? And you know, I've seen different places where there's very, very good high overarching architectural view of what's going on. But then some of the details in the lower end of the technical implementation get missed. So you end up, whichever way you're coming from, you want to start making small changes to try to improve that. So to take my example of the each individual endpoint was beautifully documented, but nothing tied it all together. Okay, what, what are some potential next steps for doing that? It could be in the documentation for that endpoint in the summary you say okay so then you use this endpoint next or you create a guide with an overall view of okay here's the list of endpoints in order that you use so it's if you at least know where your final goal is at the end you can just do some brainstorming <laughs> almost sometimes of okay if i'm coming at this from a customer's point of view what are they going to be doing this is something I've seen a lot of teams with. They get so head down into their own world that it does take taking a moment to step back and see what's the greater context of this process or this system or this endpoint for the rest of our system and be able to pull it together that way. When you start automating processes, and we can stay at documentation processes, but I have a feeling the principles hold anywhere. When you start automating the documentation processes, where would you say are typically the points that you have these, let's say glass ceilings or glass walls, that is just, you will inevitably bump into it because, because it's a social technical complexity. And it is the, typically the, the point where it's very hard to step through because you want to have the resilience, but you want to automate more and you don't know which one to lose first. Yeah, and absolutely. I, I, I'm, I know I'm biased, but I do believe this can apply in plenty of other processes. Um, one of the big ones that I've seen is, you know, the, the ideal is that you have your low-lying code, you have all of the documentation that's going to be present to the customers in your low-lying code. And that gets propagated through creating your open API spec file or however you do it. One of the big stumbling blocks that I've seen is actually there's kind of two that are related. One is you're trying to come into an established code base that doesn't have this standard of documentation in code. And the other kind of related one is how do you get your technical writers and that group working together with software engineers. And again, this is one where I'm very biased because I have a background in software engineering and in writing. So I can I can talk to both sides pretty easily, but I know that's absolutely not the case. So the you know one possible way of dealing with this is you come up with your ideal automated process for everything from your low-line code to your OAS file at the end and maybe say you do a manual edit at one point in the process to clean up documentation, add in documentation, or maybe you get technical writers who you teach them just enough code and they're going in and making PRs in GitHub on the code base. The big one there is individual documentation for individual fields is difficult sometimes to keep up on. And a lot of times for somebody who isn't in the code base constantly, and I, I don't mean that by saying this, that somebody who's not a software engineer can't understand this. It's purely a function of a lot of times somebody will be working on this code base and they're so deep into it that nobody else, even other software engineers in a company, know what's going on. You can get into a point where people get so siloed with their information that it's hard to break out of that. So how do you deal with that? You can 
you know, one easy way is come up with some standards. Okay, if your company uses a specific UUID to follow one bit of information, okay, let's say that there's a set of documentation or even just a doc string that's related to that UUID that propagates everywhere in the system. Like that's a possible option. Or let's say you've got an endpoint that does one specific process. Okay, pull in technical writer in your design process or your architecture process and get them to say, okay, this is the text you need to put in here. There's so many potential steps where a little bit of interaction can go a long way. I've had plenty of times where you try to come up with this great architecture for a system early on, you build the whole thing, and then all of a sudden you forget one requirement or somebody comes back and says, oh yeah, actually we need to do this a little bit differently and it upends all the work you've done. So I'm always a, an advocate of getting everybody talking super early in the process, but that never really kind of works. You often are coming into, oh, we've built this entire code base. Now we just need to write the documentation for it, which a lot of times is an awful way to have to deal with this because you're under time pressures, they're trying to deliver this product, and you've got two days to write documentation for a gigantic system that you haven't seen before. That's the big one. So the way I like to look at it is to break that down into, okay, we, we can't fix all of this right now, but let's start little by little adding these in. A thing that I'm bumping into now as a question is... The conflict between knowing that you should not over plan a system, but incrementally build it versus there are certain things that got to be got right in the first place, because it's going to be really hard to do it wrong. And the answer to that is, yeah, you got to plan more, you got to plan better. And the answer to that is, yeah, time and money. Where do you resolve these? It would be absolutely wonderful if we could plan ahead and know all of the potential pitfalls way ahead of time. And yeah, that, that would be wonderful. And I would love to see that happen someday. And I don't think it has ever happened. The biggest way that I've seen being able to handle those sorts of things is in the front end, acknowledging how much that you're not going to know. I used to do a lot of planning and estimation for larger industrial projects. And quoting out a system, a $2 million system that's going to pump chemicals in a plant, say. I'd go through an estimation process and essentially do a basic design for whatever system this was, come up with the cost for everything, and then start adding in extra hours or extra money, knowing that, okay, I haven't completely solved this problem before. I'm going to have to make up something from scratch. So there's a bigger chance that there's going to be something that I've missed. Maybe in one part of the system, I say, I'm going to add 50% to this because I'm guessing that one third of my time is going to be used up by things that I didn't expect. Yet in other parts of the system, it's okay, I've done this part of the system a hundred times before, and I'm just going to drop in an existing design. And for that, I may put in 5% of extra time, knowing that one twenty-first of my time is not being used up by, <laughs> is being used up by things I didn't expect. Always having that past experience of knowing what you've done before and how much confidence you have in it is great. But if you're stuck going into it with just knowing absolutely nothing, sometimes you kind of have to take a guess. And I always like being able to put in that extra block of time of, okay, let's say a third of our time we're going to have to add in for dealing with unexpected things. And sometimes you get it right and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you use absolutely zero of that time and sometimes you use twice as much of that time that you thought. But getting good at that estimation part is critically important. And that's something that I like being able to pass on to more junior people because it absolutely is something that you have to learn from through experience. And you can't just have a company where everybody is brand new to this and expect everything to go right. You will have people who, oh, well, I've been estimating these systems for 10 years. I've been doing t-shirt size estimation for this sort of thing. I can come up with, okay, this is a large. Being able to keep that knowledge passed through to more junior people is critically important because I've seen places where they don't put time into that. And then all of a sudden your higher up people retire or get hit by a bus or whatever. And all of a sudden you're wondering why all of your estimation for your project is off by a factor of three. 
I've totally seen it happen. And a lot of times people can't figure out where this came from. It's like, oh, well, they must have just screwed up this project. When in reality, there's a lot more deep-seated procedural problems that have finally come to light. It's finally come around to <laughs> cause problems. When it comes to documentation, naively, it could be, well, this is a system. So if the documentarians are brought in later in the process to document it, like you said, the system works fine, no issues. So the documentation should be a straightforward description, but it isn't. No, absolutely not. <laughs> what is, what is the, the, the mindset that you can give through to uh, less experienced colleagues who feel frustrated because it's, they think it's, it's on them? The biggest thing, too, is that you can go into it kind of in the situation where you explained of a documentarian gets given one week just before they need to ship a product to write all the documentation. Going into it, realizing that you might find big problems that people missed is actually really important because it's another thing that I have seen happen. It won't be until the very end of the process where somebody that seems completely unrelated to the design of the project says, oh, this thing is supposed to do X, Y, Z, and it's not doing any of that. Why is that? And then that works its way back. Going into this with a mindset of, I'm a customer who has never seen this before, or I'm a junior engineer who has gotten this dumped on my lap to implement at my company and I've never seen this before. Taking that very almost naive look at how you're going to write this documentation is really important because then you don't miss things. I've absolutely gone into writing documentation for systems where I've thought, oh, like everybody knows how to do this and just skip over that part of an implementation where that's actually critically important. And there's a lot of people who won't make that assumption. Trying to have as, as much of a naive mind going into it and it's always hard to not make assumptions. I know we all make assumptions, but trying not to is really important because you might end up running into those situations where all of a sudden there's a critical part of functionality that you are the one who has found out this has been missed. And that happens. And if you don't catch that in your documentation, then the end customer is going to find it. And the normal process is, okay, end customer is like, they're like, oh, I don't know how to do this thing. I'll find the documentation. Oh, this isn't documented. How is this? How does this actually work? And then they realize that what they critically need is not implemented, and then it all goes downhill from there. How do you document a social technical system? How do you document the people into the process? The thing that people do, but it's they make the decision on a moment's notice. They drive the car. How do you document both the mechanical workings and the driver's intuition into the same same documentation system? Is it even possible? This is an old question of mine. It's really a pet peeve. And I know that the closest we could get was um, dance choreography, almost. Yeah, that's, that's actually a really interesting uh, way of thinking about it in the way of choreography. Yeah, it, it's absolutely the eternal question that I'm not sure I've ever seen anybody get completely right. And you still need to work on it because if you go into it not understanding kind of what you're getting at, not understanding where the people fit into it, things are going to go wrong. And a lot of what you can run into is not understanding the expectations of different people in different roles. Say what you might have in a process is if you've got a software engineer who's writing the software and then a technical writer who's doing the documentation, a product manager who's putting it all together, a lot of companies will just say, oh, well, if you're a software engineer, you're obviously doing X, Y, and Z. And if you're a documentarian, you're doing A, B, and C without ever having written that down. A great place that I believe to start from is having expectations of different people very explicitly defined, you know, in the way of kind of the dance choreography is like, okay, I'm going to be in this box and these are the specific moves that I need to be able to know how to do. In the same way, we can say, okay, a software engineer, our expectations for somebody doing that role is you're going to write software in this 
whatever language that you're using, you are going to have this level of explanation about how you write these functions. Maybe in your company, you say, okay, the expectation of a software engineer is that they will write basic documentation for this thing, knowing that documentarians will work with that to make it better. You may say that, hey, like our product manager is the one responsible for keeping the software engineer in line with making sure they write documentation. But having all of those expectations laid out explicitly in the beginning gets you a long way down that track to getting all the people to work together because you know that not everybody is going to work for your company for their entire life. What was it the average tenure in a software engineering job is something like two years, which is not a lot of time. And you're always going to have that turnover. And you know, I've seen plenty of companies where you have essentially one generation of software engineers who have this set of expectations, and then you go four years down the road, and that has completely changed, um, sometimes for the better and sometimes not. But if you can lay that out early on enough, then you know essentially the rules for how everybody is going to engage with this project. And in time, you can change those expectations if that doesn't work for you. And if you're seeing that, oh, like our documentarians end up having to spend four weeks rewriting these things because software engineers are writing documentation, but it doesn't really apply for what we want. So you keep on tweaking it as you go, but at least that's a starting point. Do you have a story where there's a good process, all very working very smoothly, documentation process, let's stay with that, good team but you can feel that it's not resilient enough. I know of a method where you do like these hypothetical exercises of, and then the aliens invaded, which part of the system collapsed, like that kind of way. But do you have stories of how you make sure that there's enough fluidity? It's an interesting problem because you can absolutely get down the rabbit hole of, okay, well, what if aliens invade while I'm working on this project? It's pretty difficult because we can't always understand all the specifics of the technological side of a process. It's it's pretty much impossible. The one story I like telling from the world of motorsports is, you know, we think of tires on a race car or tires on your passenger car. They create grip, you can turn the steering wheel, you go around a corner, you don't slide off the road. Unless it's icy, like sometimes it has been here in Portland. But for the most part, you think tires are pretty simple. When in reality, we don't actually know exactly how tires make grip. We have theories about it. We can characterize different performance of tires. There's literally a formula called the Pacheca Magic Formula because it was written by Professor Pacheca at the University of Delft, who has this formula that is the magic formula that last I saw had something like 35 different constants that you use to characterize how a tire makes grip on a corner. And every few years, it gets expanded a little bit more, but we just don't know everything about how this works. And this formula does a pretty good approximation, but it's not exact. What does that translate into? It translates into you put these tires on the car, and for the most part, you kind of understand how that works, but it's not perfect by any stretch. So being able to understand that the technology is not always going to work exactly the way you expect is critically important. I was trying to find the study I, I think I mentioned in the talk where I think Motorola did a study of all of their integrated circuit little chip packages, and they found that over something like eight pins on a little chip, the documentation was never correct there was always an error in the documentation somewhere. They never got it completely characterized perfectly. There was always something that, like the chip performed a little bit differently than they completely understood. So the documentation wasn't absolutely right. But it was absolutely mind blowing that you think this tiny little computer chip with eight pins on it, and we can't even document that correctly. And this is coming from a company like Motorola that they kind of know what they're doing and you would assume that they could do this right. But even for them to not be able to get this absolutely completely right is it, it is kind of mind blowing. So understanding that there's always going to be these little gaps as we go along, we can kind of leave space for our intuition or 
our problem solving ability to fill those gaps in when something does go wrong. It's critically important because I always say when you're working in a company where we all got hired on here for a reason, we're all intelligent people who we know what we're doing. Something goes wrong sometimes, but you know we are smart people and we can handle this. And the really important part of that intelligence is not being able to do it right all the time. It's understanding where you might get it wrong. Yeah, you really got me with the tires. I remember at university, I studied chemistry, and that university, I think one of the things that had me absolutely fascinated, I knew I didn't want to be busy in that part of chemistry, but I was mesmerized. And that was colloidal sciences. It's just, they had so many, so much information. But at the end of the day, all the professors always said, yeah, but we don't really know. Don't forget that. We don't really know. It just is. That was awesome. Yeah, it's amazing how many fields are exactly like that. Like you look at the world of neuropsychology and even things like antidepressant medication. They're like, yeah, but we don't exactly know how this works. We just know that this works. And it's so, sometimes, yeah, it is truly amazing how much the world is based on things like that, that we kind of know what it what it does but there's so much room where things aren't going to work the way that we thought it did and you know that's that's the beauty of the scientific method we keep on going back and refining our uh, our assumptions on these things and trying to block that out block out that idea of oh well this is a computer so we know exactly what's happening no matter what all the time it's really misleading, and I've seen people get into that trap where they do make that assumption of, oh, well, this is always going to work exactly the way I expect, and it's going to be consistent every time. And, you know, there's a couple different traps you end up in. One is, okay, well, the system actually isn't working exactly the same every time because of something we didn't expect. Or, my understanding of the system isn't actually correct. And, Either one, the end result is, oh, well, this isn't working the way I expected, and this is a problem. But being able to to see those differences and account for them and you know, be able to make changes to handle those differently helps a lot. So we come back to expectation management and resilience. Exactly. Yeah, it's the whole thing with expectations is you know you're always going to have something go wrong, but if you think, okay, if something in this category of things go wrong, we know that this person should be able to handle it. It gets almost into some principles around incident management where let's say there's a forest fire and you cannot plan exactly for what's going to happen if there's a forest fire. You know that there's going to be some trees and you know that they're going to be on fire. And beyond that, you kind of have to figure out as you go. So there's tons of research and learning that you can do in how to manage an incident. Um, you know, in the United States, there's FEMA, uh, Federal Emergency Management Authority. They have a whole series of courses on incident management, which is actually kind of fascinating to see how they set up process for that. And the biggest part of it is that FEMA's incident management system concepts, you build a structure where you have all of these people in a very well-defined structure with, okay, you've got an incident commander, then you have all of these people who are handling logistics, you have one person who will handle communications and so on down the line. And each of those people has a lot of latitude in how they do their job, but it's still in a very structured sort of way. You know, you go into a forest fire and one time maybe it's, oh, I'm out in the middle of national forest land and it's 10 acres that are burning and it's not going to really threaten any homes or people. It's very different than here in Portland. A few years ago, we had a lot of forest fires that were encroaching on our city boundary. And all of a sudden, that's a very different problem to have to solve because you've got not only the threat to people and property, but you've got people who are worried and then people who are trying to evacuate, where do they go, trying to figure out places where people could take their pets was a whole other thing. It just opens up this huge set of problems. But having that structure of, okay, if it's this kind of problem, this is the person who's going to have to solve it. 
that that helps lay out those expectations a lot better because then all of a sudden you know, okay, this person is handling all of the accommodations for people who need to evacuate. Now it's their problem. They have to find a way to help these people who have brought their cats and dogs because they're not going to leave them at home, but they need to find a place to go because certain places won't allow pets. And then all of a sudden you've turned from, okay, this is a problem that we never could have planned for or probably should have planned for, but didn't think about. And all of a sudden we're handling that in a pretty streamlined, efficient sort of way. Yeah, you kind of just described parenting to me. <laughs> but what I'm hearing is if I imagine a, a, a team, especially around an API, and that includes documentation, that to me sounded like if we are not sure what we need to do in a situation, then we do need to know how we're going to communicate and who's wearing what hat. So not all of the variables can be unknown. And this is why you were saying it's very important that we know ourselves and about the others what to expect from a specific role. Because then if that role comes into my room and says, I need to do this, then we don't question that because we know why they are saying they need to do that. And therefore, we cooperate and we communicate faster about that. And for tech writers, them being at the hub, this is pretty important to know where. Yeah, exactly. And, I, you know, I've lost track how many times I've been at companies where trying to find the right person to ask the question is a whole day ordeal. Yeah. But knowing that, okay, if I've got an issue with this, this is the person I talk to. And even getting to the point of, okay, if I have a question about this thing and I can't figure out who the person is to talk to, here's the central person to talk to who will help me with that. Because there's always going to be something that is going to be outside of what everybody expected. And, you know, going back to the, the forest fire idea, you go all the way up to the head incident commander and they are the one who has control over, well, I don't want to say control, but authority over everything that's going on. And if you can't find the home for this question somewhere else, that lands on their plate and they have to deal with that. So even just realizing that, okay, we need to have one person who's going to handle all the questions that we have no idea how to handle, that becomes their job and they get to use their creative skills to find a new solution to that and hopefully improve the process for next time to handle that better the next time it comes up. And where does that go with more and more automated processes where um, it's a docs process automation gets more and more intricate. We didn't even bring in AI yet, but we did. It gets more and more intricate. And then that person leaves the company. That's another eternal question that everybody runs into, especially in smaller companies, because you can absolutely have one person who's writing all the documentation and then they leave. You might not have time to actually ask them questions and get a debrief from them. If it's a process where it's automated code converting your API into whatever documentation, having documentation for your documentation team <laughs> is another important thing to have. It kind of goes, keeps on going all the way down. Have you seen that before? Like theoretically, it's great, but have you seen this happen? Yeah, it's, um, you know, I've absolutely had places where even like six months down the road, you look at something that had been running what seemed to be smoothly for quite a while and then something breaks. And you have to go back and reverse engineer everything that happened there. There's a big difference between, you know, saying you've got an automated process that's 10,000 lines of Perl and trying to uh, reverse engineer that, which is absolutely ridiculous to try to do. Or you've got, say, code with some good documentation, at least to tell you what's going on bit by bit through this process. And it almost comes back to that idea of responsibility as well, where it should be people's responsibility to have succession planning in their head. Um, I, was, I just had a conversation recently about succession planning for leadership, where you're not writing these processes for yourself, you're writing it for the person who's filling your shoes once you leave. And that really comes down to even not just leadership, but individual people when you get into that situation of, okay, I could be the only person left who actually knows how to do the thing. So it, it's something good to keep in mind of, okay, how am I going to make sure that 
this is going to work not just for me, but for everybody else down the line. We don't always have time for that. So it's, it's definitely a higher philosophical level of question to think about. But having those processes in place, and you know, the, the ideal is you have a process for, okay, every time I come up with a new process, I'm going to make sure this is documented in Confluence or in a Google Doc or however you want to do it. And being able to just have a library of, okay, this is how this thing works. This is the knowledge that has been passed down verbally from engineer to engineer. And getting that written down, um, it's the eternal struggle. I, I had one, one external system I had to deal with quite a while back where it was literally the only people who knew how to do it would just verbally tell you, oh, you log into this thing, and then here are the commands that you type in. And the commands were completely cryptic. It was like, you type in QZR2, and it'll bring up this screen that'll give you this really important report. And sure enough, it got to the point where one of those people who knew that had that knowledge left the company. And I was like, okay, I am writing everything down now. (laughs) And you know, I approached it as, okay, I'm just going to essentially write a one-page guide to how to do this thing. And it was a critical enough process that it was really important. And people still reference that guide to this day where they can go back and look to this one specific thing. And it also extends to higher level process as well, where if we don't have, again, explicit expectations of do we know how we're going to handle this set of circumstances, if we don't have it written down, it's going to be down to everybody having to figure it out for themselves every single time. And that doesn't serve anybody. (laughs) It's just, it's adding a lot of work for everybody. But if we can say, if we deal with a forest fire this time where we have a lot of people evacuating with pets, how do we handle this? Okay, next time we know that the last time we found these hotels that were pet friendly and then put people up in there, then that helps propagate that knowledge a little bit better. But it's it's an eternal struggle for sure. You being a technical writer or a disposition of a technical writer to not just being technical writer, and there's so many ways to document things now. How do you go about the, yeah, and there's a document for that. And then suddenly there's 10,000 documents and you just need to know the search word, which gets you to one level higher problem with the same kind. How did you deal with this? I wish I had a great solution for that. <laughs> it's, it, it honestly is something that I'm still trying to figure out better ways to do. It's because, yeah, you absolutely get into a situation where you've got 10,000 documents for how do you deal with this specific thing and it gets buried so we have the table of contents as the obvious but did you find a different way to show the mental map that people can follow there's a couple different ways you can do it yeah obviously table of contents and having essentially big buckets that you can put processes in is it's a relatively straightforward way of doing it and it's very user-friendly because somebody knows okay i need a process for doing doing a specific thing. Okay, I found the bucket for this. Another way you can look at it is thinking of it in almost going back to what I was saying with a customer trying to access your API for the first time, a sort of process oriented look where, you know, you can, you can go as high level as you want. Say, think of an employee starting with a company. What's the process that they're going to go through? They're going to have onboarding and an onboarding they're going to have to step through getting a computer getting their account set up getting access to everything you can take each one of those steps on its own and you can keep on going higher from that you can think okay like what's the the essential life cycle of an employee at a company there's onboarding there's going to be the time that they're working as an individual contributor, then maybe they work in management, and then maybe there's offboarding. So you can look at each chunk of those as, okay, we're going to organize process like that and all of our reference that way. So you've got one big bucket for onboarding, one big bucket for work as an individual contributor, one big bucket for um, promotion and advancement, and so on. 
and you can keep on going as high as you want. You can go to essentially the life cycle, life cycle of a company where you get to, okay, like what do we need to do while we're just in steady state when we want to grow and so on. And, you know, when you have time to do that, that helps a lot. It obviously doesn't always solve the problem of you've got an imminent issue that you need to deal with right now. And kind of the more time that you have to think about these things, the easier you need to make it. Back when I worked in motorsports, a lot of times we would have essentially a flow chart with, okay, this thing has gone wrong. And you'd say, okay, we'll step through these options. We'll do this, then this, then this. And you're talking about decisions that you had to make in in a matter of seconds and you want it as simple as possible i i would have telemetry up on my computer showing me what's going on with the car and if a tire went flat i had a big red thing that showed up on the computer that showed me immediately and i you know i had one time where i was able to tell that the tire was going flat earlier than the driver could and we radioed in to let him know to come in before he even realized anything So you need to kind of approach like how imminent of an issue is this and how easy do I need to make it? Because sometimes you have the luxury of having more time to try to find what you need to find for kind of those more edge cases of we've got a new employee, but they don't have a name that can be rendered in Roman characters. So we need to figure out how to adjust our HR system to handle that. You don't need an immediate decision for that, and there's probably going to be some creativity involved in that. But you can approach it with how big of an issue is it and how quickly do I have to approach it and prioritize how easy it is to find the documentation that way. There's a a really good philosophy in safety engineering that is essentially a matrix where you say, how often is this issue going to come up? And you'll say, okay, maybe once a year, once a month, once a day, once an hour. And then the other axis is how big of an impact safety-wise is this when this goes wrong? And there's categories for no injury, no damage to equipment. Then there's no physical injury, but damage to equipment, minor physical injury, major physical injury, and death. And you look at that matrix and you can prioritize how you want to approach these. And the same sort of way with documentation for the high impact, high frequency things, you make it really easy to find that documentation (laughs) and prioritize being able to find that. Because if you've got something that'll create major injury that may happen once a shift, then you need to be able to handle that very quickly. So I'm grappling a lot of these things myself, trying to see how you can be minimal in the cognitive load without losing the full understanding of the complexity. And then you end up with, well, we need different models from different perspectives. And then you get to, but now we have so many models, suddenly I don't know what to look at. And back then you're back to square one and you start thinking all over again. Yeah, trying to prioritize all that is, it is a struggle for sure. I wish I had all the perfect answers for that. One of these days, I'll get a little bit better at it. Then thank you very much for the conversation. As a closing, do you want to leave the listeners with one message you certainly want them to remember? Yeah, the biggest one that you you kind of reference is don't let great be the enemy of good and making whatever small changes you can is going to be worthwhile. You can't change the world in a day, but you can at least do a little something every single day to make things better. And that is absolutely worthwhile. And don't let yourself get dragged down by not being able to make a difference if you're doing that. Wholeheartedly agreed. And thank you very much. Thanks for having me on, Laura. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. We thank our colleagues at Pronovis Developer Portals for letting us work on this and the entire API community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest that you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website, api.docs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API.docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.